Great. Well, a very good evening to you all. Whether you're joining us live or whether you're watching the recording, we're really glad you're here. It's great. My name is Bev Doubly. I work for a church in the centre of Norwich um, called Surrey Chapel, and um, I'm your host for this evening. Tonight is the final webinar in a series of three that we've we've done over the last few weeks. Um, exploring three issues that we know have been increasingly felt since lockdown so we've looked at anxiety and money worries and tonight we're looking at depression as you'll know and um, we know that these are things that um, for, for some people um, they've come about since lockdown for others they have lived with them for a long time so in each of our events we've invited guests to come and speak and they're people who have had some personal experience of the topic themselves have some expertise to share and but all have ha had had a conviction that the god of the bible has something to say about our suffering and can speak into it and um, if you left if you um, missed sorry if you missed the last two webinars you can find them on YouTube, on the Surrey Chapel YouTube page online where they've been recorded. And if you're helped by what you hear tonight and perhaps you'd like to share it with a friend, um, this will also be recorded and will be made available in the next couple of days. So our title tonight is Darkness on Your Mind and we're going to be exploring the topic of depression. And I'm assuming that those amongst us who are watching, um, some of you will be suffering with depression. Um, some of you are, are wanting just to be helped to be able to better support those close to you with depression. But I think um, for all of us, um, depression is close, isn't it? So um, in the UK, the, the stats say that somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of us will have a diagnosis of depression at some point in our lives. Um, the World Health Organization estimates that with the current trajectory, by 2030, depression will be the second cause of disability. We're, we're also told that, that twice as many women suffer from depression as men. And yet um, some of the research that's coming out of lockdown is saying that, that men have been hit harder than women generally by the effects of isolation from friends and colleagues. And so um, medical professions are waving a flag of concern over men's mental health and the rates of depression as we emerge from this season. So depression is, is very common and close to us all. And um, I'm sure you'll know it can be um, debilitating and, and destructive in people's lives and it can beset us for years and years as well. So um, I experienced depression for three years, um, but one person I was talking to um, last night has been struggling with it for nearly 40 years. Mm -hmm. So um, some folks live with this for a very long time. But tonight we're exploring the, the issue of God and depression. So Christians claim that God has created all of us, that he knows us inside out, um, that he's in control of this world, that he's in control of our lives and that he loves us. And the depressed person may understandably say, Christian or not, um, how can a loving God want this for my life? Um, how can he allow it to happen to me? Does he have the power to give me hope for an end to all of this. So here tonight to give us a better understanding um, of depression and what God says about it um, is pastor and author John Hindley. I'm going to introduce you to him in a moment and he's going to speak for around 30 minutes about this issue, helping us understand more about depression and what God says to the depressed. Um, then we're going to have an opportunity for Q&A um, and as you're listening you might want to um, type in some questions. You can do that on the chat bar that will come up at the side of your screen. So if you have any questions those will come directly to me and um, you can also, so Kieran sent a note down here, thank you Kieran, you can also text that number if you prefer to do that as well. Um, but let me welcome John. John Hindley, thank you so much for, for being willing to come and speak to us this evening. John, can you tell us a little bit about yourself and um, your family? Certainly, yes. Thank you. Um, I'd love to do that. My name's John Hindley. Uh, I live out in Fretnam, um, about eight miles north of Norwich. 
Uh, I serve as pastor of Broad Grace Church, which meets in Coltishall, just a couple of miles down the road from where I live. Um, I'm married to Felicity. Uh, most people call her Flick. She's a, a lovely, um, godly wife, uh, delightful woman. And we have three little girls. Daisy is nine, Eliza is eight, and Sylvia is five. Um, and shortly, their ages will line up with two years in between. But I think I got them right. Um, so, yeah, that's me. That's, that's who we are. Thank you, John. John, you're a Christian and you're a pastor. Can you tell us a little bit about that, that role in your church? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, in the Bible, God um, ordains that churches are led um, by the Lord Jesus Christ, by God's son. And then under him are a little group of men called elders or pastors or, or other titles who try to care for the church and serve the church. Um, and the church is, is a family. Um, the church is called the household, the family of God. And the idea of a church is, I, I like to think of a church as, um, you're, you're, it's like being a bunch of mountaineers and you're lost in the fog and you don't really know what you're doing, um, but you rope yourselves together and and you rope yourselves to a sure-footed guide who promises to get you to safety the guide is jesus and the church are the bunch of people who say we're going to rope each other together and make sure that we all get there um so so that's what a, a church is it's it's the family of god um broad grace is a little church about 35 adults about 15 kids uh we we're which makes it very easy to kind of know each other and be in and out of each other's lives and sharing our lives which is is part of the joy and part of the challenge because life in this world is really difficult and to to share those burdens with one another is is wonderfully helpful and and really sad um and i think that's that's what church life is um often we give the impression in churches that everyone's happy and sort of sorted and they've all got their stuff together um, and they managed to get up in the morning and and function um, and and that's a shame because that's not the case um, and and we are broken we are hurting we are people who are hurt by others we're people who hurt others um, we are we are not sorted we do not have our stuff together and a lot of us are not happy um, but Jesus holds us and cares for us and will get us safely off the mountain. Mm, thank you. That's a, a really helpful kind of visual analogy for us. Thank you, John. Now, it's interesting you say all that because I was thinking if people have Googled, Googled you in advance, they might notice that you've written a number of books and a couple of them have got interesting titles. So, so one of them is Dealing with Disappointment. And another one is um, suffering and singing, knowing God's love in pain and despair. And I guess off the back of what you've just said, some people might be surprised to hear that a pastor might know these emotions um, at close hand. And you think mm, when you become a Christian, do you not trade pain and despair for, for joy and hope? But clearly, um, as you've just said, um, Christians know pain and suffering as well. Are, are you able to summarise some of what you have experienced um, the darkness as we've entitled today's talk? Yeah, I, I am, and I'm very happy. Yeah, I want to be open and honest. I've I've certainly not suffered with depression nearly as as seriously as um, others who I love, um, who I care for. It is a, a horrible condition. It really is. Um, I'm looking forward to the day when it's it's banished by Jesus when he comes back. But my my personal experience, um, I think, has been I, I am a bit of an up and down person. I always have been. Um, and I've always had, I guess, what I would have called days when I've been pretty low. Uh, but two and a half years ago, just after Christmas, um, beginning of 2018, I, I suffered a, a season of of sort of um, probably eight or nine depressive episodes that lasted for four or five days each. And, and whilst they weren't long in their, um, in their duration, they were quite severe in their intensity. Um, so I experienced the, the sort of numbness, the sadness, the, um, 
the hopelessness and the despair that that characterizes depression um i, I kind of recognized it uh having walked with with quite a few people over the years um yeah if 10 to 20 percent is the diagnosis uh my hunch is that that the number of people who suffer with depression is far higher and it's a it's a spectrum disorder i think where um, I'm not an expert, I'm not a trained counsellor, but my experience as a, as a pastor has been that everyone knows what the shallow end is like and and then the deep end is it is the the experience of a few, the terrible experience of a few. Um, and I, I have not been in the deep end, you know, I have friends who for years this has been their life. Um, but, but I had those those experiences that, that rocked me and were, were incredibly hard trying to, um, I remember standing up to preach one Sunday, feeling just as if I was, empty's not strong enough, feeling as if I was almost a void, not there, um, a sort of nothing. And, and, and just surprised that even words came out. Um, so, so that was that was part of it. I, I was blessed. My church family, my fellow elders, my community group were um, delightful. I, I remember sharing it with my community group, um, and and one of the other guys just said, "said John, this isn't your problem. This is our problem," um, which is just so lovely to hear uh, in that that season. Um, since then, uh, things have been better. And part of what I'll do tonight is just talk about what helped me. Uh, it might not help you um different things help different people but i think hearing something of one person's experience can sometimes give us some uh some handholds which might be of use um but it's not gone away I, i've suffered those episodes i told my wife earlier saying what's true she would say it's got uh better um but i'm still down in that dark place less often for less time but it still happened. I also, back in March this year, had my first panic attack, um, which I think was related, my depression is related to anxiety, the two go together for me, I can't very easily separate them. But um, that was quite a, a terrifying experience. Um, I, I didn't recognize it, I thought I was dying, which is, is pretty normal um, in a panic attack. I read up afterwards, uh, my wife spotted it immediately, which was a wonderful blessing because she told me I was having a panic attack. And then I remembered what I'd been taught about panic attacks in my pastoral counselling um, uh, modules back at, at Bible College. And, and that was helpful because I knew I probably wasn't dying. Uh, but that was terrifying. Um, and, and I think it's like I'm still trying to work through. I was talking to a counsellor about it and he, he thought it was probably a warning shot of just doing too much, worrying too much, not spending enough time on my spiritual life with the Lord. Um, so so that's that's been a more recent experience that I still think I'm probably um, processing. I thought I might try and get a break and then uh, this coronavirus happened um, so so that's not happened but but the lord is very kind to his people um Bev, that was a bit rambly do you want to pick up on it no that's great thank you look i'm gonna let you carry on now without any interruption we really want to, to hear more of your story and also what uh, what you believe god um says and can say to the depressed so over to you john thank you Lovely, thank you. I'm just going to share my screen so you can see my PowerPoint slides. Um, hopefully, you can all see those. It says darkness on your mind, which is what this evening's called. Um, and, and as Bev said, there's going to be a chance for questions later. And I'm, I'm happy for you to ask anything about my experience, um, about what I say. Um, I will have a go at answering. As I said, I'm not an expert on depression. Um, I've had a lot of experience of common or garden very common depression um, in myself and in others it is a very common condition i've not had as much experience of the, the really deep end of the sea of darkness um, i think what i'll say should be useful even if that's where you are but if that is where you are um, if you haven't already you, speaking to a doctor is wise uh, engaging with a counselor i think is very wise 
as well. Um, I think there are there is other help you can get um, as well as this sort of resource where someone's talking to you um, and and yet there's not you're not in the same room. Um, I always wanted to say I, I watched a webinar that was recorded I think not very long ago um, which was on depression with Andrew Nichols who is um, one of the people involved with uh, Biblical Counselling UK. He teaches counselling, I think, at Oak Hill College. He really knows what he's talking about. And he led an excellent seminar on depression, which you can find on the internet. Um, I will put the link later in the resource section, but if you go onto YouTube and um, search Andrew Nichols depression, then um, I think you'll get that, that up. And that he engages things like medication, um, which I'm, I'm not going to engage with because I've not had direct experience of that. So if you would like more after this evening, that would be a very useful next place to go. As I said, I'll put a slide of resources up at the end so you can always get the details there. But just to, to start with, um, what, what are we talking about? I've called it darkness and depression because I think sometimes we can it can be hard to know what to label things. I sometimes feel like a bit of a fraud saying I suffer with depression because I know other people will will use that that diagnosis for a much more serious, um, nastier situation than I'm in. So I sometimes feel, say, first say I struggle with the darkness. Um, but, but I think it's just finding language that's helpful for you. I don't think it matters too much as long as it helps you explain to others. Um, so well, what are we talking about? As I said, it's a spectrum of emotional distress. Um, it's a, it is distressing. And this evening we are more going to be in the shallow end of that sea of darkness. Okay, my experience has been that it's a sadness, um, a numbness. Just I just don't care. Um, I don't care if my wife loves me. I don't care what's happening. Um, a lack of hope. It's hard to believe that things will ever get better. It's hard to believe that there might be uh, good that could come into our lives. And, and a tiredness, that just no energy. Uh, it's exhausting being depressed. And, and, and alongside that, you feel stupid being tired because, well, I've not done anything. I've not been able to get out of bed. So, so how am I so tired? It's also important to realize it's an all person condition. And this is, I think, what makes it so hard to understand what's going on. Now, in one sense, everything is an all person condition. I remember my father-in-law, who's a doctor, um, telling me some research he'd read on people who had broken bones in accidents, people who'd broken their leg or something. And the time it took them to heal could be doubled or halved depending on their, their mental state. So something that would seem almost entirely a physical issue, it's a, it's a broken arm because I, I fell off my bike, is, is impacted by our, our mental state, our emotional state. So how much more something like depression? Uh, it affects our body, it affects our mind, it affects our heart, and it affects our soul. Back into the present. Uh, it can be bodily illness. Um, if you are laid low, um, then, then that can be awful. It can be something as simple as that, that broken leg, you're housebound for, for a season, and you, you find that very hard. Um, and, and I think certainly um, bodily illness can, can play a, a major part. As I understand it, there's not clarity on sort of what is cause and what is effect sometimes with, with chemical imbalances in the brain, but, but clearly there are physical factors that either contribute or lead to depression. I, I suffer with the sort of seasonal um, affective disorder, I think, where I, I do definitely uh, struggle in the winter. Um, and I found vitamin D pills have been a real help for me. Um, it's a very simple physical um, matter. Often I think it's a combination. There may be 
a, a tough season with a lot of ongoing grind in life and then something goes catastrophically wrong and you just have got no reserves left to cope or at that point um, an illness hits and and it hits you so much harder than you imagined because your reserves have been utterly diminished and you were running on vapor anyway so, so i think it can be a combination and i think the coronavirus and the lockdown will have tipped many people into depression um, i think it'll be huge i think I, I think it is just a wonderful gift of god that sorry chapel are running these webinars um, when i listened to helen thorne speak uh, the first one on anxiety and then john speaking on money worries i thought this is this is so helpful uh, this is where we are this is this is what we need these are the things that are not talked about that often and yet are going to be the common experience of many families um, because of course depression you'll know if you're if you're caring for someone with depression it does not affect just one person it affects uh, their family their household their friendships their wider family it is a, a it's like a sort of black octopus at times with tentacles that stretch out very wide but i think as well there is something realistic in depression and this is the strange thing. I, I think those who are depressed, in some ways we struggle to see clearly, but in others we see with greater clarity, maybe than others do. Um, let me read you a little bit from the Bible. I'll put it up on the screen. This is written by King Solomon, who was known as the wisest man who ever lived. And he wrote a book called Ecclesiastes, which is part of the Bible. And towards the beginning, he says this, I, the teacher, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on mankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, a chasing after the wind. And Solomon will use this book to explore all the different blessings and gifts of this life and show how all of them are meaningless and are chasing after the wind. There is a realism in seeing the world as dark because this world is full of futility and pain and darkness. Um, now, that might shock some of you that God's book, the Bible, would, would declare that everything done under the sun is a meaningless chasing after wind. I, I actually find it beautiful. I love the idea that God understands depression and doesn't see it as, as an aberration, as, as a misfit, as something that should not be in this world. God almost sees it as a right response to a broken world and we're going to see what god does with that as we go through this evening so how do we see depression it's an all-person condition and in that it's important for us to understand that we are embodied spirits uh, we are bodies and we have souls we are more than a body uh, we all know that otherwise death would not terrify us because if it was merely physical matter reaching the end of its useful life like a broken microwave oven so what but we know it isn't we know that we have eternity bound up in our hearts we are embodied spirits and that means that to engage with darkness engage with depression without taking into account a spiritual element is foolish and 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 it, it would be like i think um a doctor trying to treat um an ill patient but deciding that that he try and do so without using antibiotics why why would you put aside such an essential um treatment to consider depression without considering 
the spiritual side is folly. Now, it'd be just as much folly, and sometimes Christians have done this, to say we'll only deal with the spiritual side as if we didn't have bodies, as if we didn't have minds and hearts and, and flesh and limbs and fingers. No, God says, I, I love all of you. I made you as soul and body, and I want you to live as soul and body. So we're going to try and deal with the whole uh, person tonight without making any false splits between body and spirit. Um, it's also a condition understood by God. Let me read you this. This is the end of Psalm 88, a psalm in the Bible. It finishes like this. From my youth I have suffered and been close to death. I have borne your terrors and am in despair. Your wrath has swept over me. Your terrors have destroyed me. All day long they surround me like a flood. They have completely engulfed me. You have taken from me friend and neighbour. Darkness is my closest friend. That's where it finishes. God understands the darkness. His Bible expresses it. I have found nothing that expresses the darkness of depression better than Psalm 88, than other Psalms, than Ecclesiastes, than the book of Job. That there, there is nothing that understands it better. God does not shy away from this condition. And, and Psalm 88 ultimately is the cry of Jesus, God's son, God himself. Because God who who created all things, God who lives in eternal light, came down to be born in the darkness as a tiny baby in Bethlehem, and then to, to die in the darkness on a wooden cross outside Jerusalem. Let me read you from the Gospel of St Luke about the death of Jesus Christ. It was now about noon and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out in a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. Jesus died in the darkness. Psalm 88 expresses the despair that God himself felt as he hung and died outside Jerusalem in the pitch black. Now we'll come in a moment to why he would do such a thing, but it's worth just pausing to, to know that he did. If you prayed to God, to Jesus, you would pray to a God who understands the darkness that fills your life. That is incredible. There is no other God who could grasp that. There's no other God who could listen to your prayer with understanding and empathy. And I think that is a treasure of infinite value when you are suffering in the darkness. Jesus died in the darkness and he rose in the light. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb, the tomb of Jesus. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb, but when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood beside them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, why do you look for the living among the dead? He is not here. He has risen. Jesus rose from the darkness in the morning light of Easter Sunday morning. He died in the darkness and as he did so, 
he broke its power and he brought the light back into the world because he is the light. This is a, a section of the Bible that has become hugely precious to me um, as I've worked through my own uh, struggles with depression. In the beginning was the word. St. John's Gospel is how it starts. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. In him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness has not overcome it. Now you might feel as though the darkness is all consuming, but God who made you says that the darkness has not overcome the light. That is incredible good news. The darkness has not overcome it. And, and I think this is the key. Because when we, we feel as though the darkness is all that there is and all that there can be, the idea that that light lives in a person, that, that the light of the world is Jesus Christ, is a person who came to love you and to die for you and to draw you to himself. The idea that light is going to come back one day when Jesus returns to this earth, it's hard to believe those things in the depths of depression. Goodness, it's hard enough to believe them on a, on a good day. But, but when they pierce through, when they pierce through, we see that actually it will not end in darkness, it will end in light. In the Bible, a day starts at dusk. So that a day starts in darkness and ends in light. Depression is like a terribly dark night. But God has appointed that each morning the sun rises so that those who are depressed will know that the darkness is not the end. The darkness of Good Friday gives way to the light of Easter Sunday morning. The darkness of night gives way to the light of the sun. The darkness of our depression will give way to the light of Jesus Christ. So how does that work? How has Christ conquered darkness and depression? We're going to look at it in terms of past, present and future, um, but we'll do past, future, present. That'll make sense when we get there. Um, first of all, the, the past is defeated darkness. The reason that Jesus died in the darkness was so that he could absorb into his own body all the power of darkness so that as he died the darkness died with him now one or more of these might might connect with you so i'll run through them but do pick up in the questions if you'd like me to go into more detail on any of them on the cross as jesus died he took our sin our sin is our our selfishness it's it's the bit of me that is glad when things go badly for a friend. Do you know what I mean? That bit of you that hear, is slightly glad when you hear a friend has bad news. That, that nasty kind of mean bit. It's the bit of me that can instantly spot the biggest piece of chocolate cake and take it without it looking like I noticed. Because I know instantly what is best for me the bit of me that can do the same thing in your life and so manipulate you by flattery or by cruelty to to get you to do or be what I want my meanness my selfishness my nastiness that that makes me unclean it makes me uh, nasty and Jesus took it 
He took it and it died with him. He took my guilt. Our, our uncleanness, our nastiness makes us guilty before God. God commands us to love himself, to love your God with all your heart, all your soul and all your strength, and to love your neighbour as yourself. God's command, his royal law, is that we love. And so often I hate or I am indifferent. I am a rebel against a good king. I am a traitor against a righteous cause. I am guilty before God. And as he dies in the darkness, Jesus took our guilt. He took it from us. He died the death of the guilty so that the guilty might live the life of the innocent. It was our death that he died. We, we fear death. I remember talking to a man who was terrified, absolutely terrified of the darkness of death. It, it, it coloured his whole life. And then he realised that Jesus had died his death so that he could live forever with Jesus. Our death has been died. The Bible says that death is now like a bee that has had its sting taken out. Can't hurt you because now Jesus has broken its power over us. If, if our faith is in Christ, if we trust in Jesus, if he is our God, then death is simply the doorway into his embrace. It is simply shutting our eyes to a loved one or a nurse or whatever it might be and opening them to the smiling face of Jesus Christ. Jesus endured our shame. They hung him naked on the cross. They spat at him. They whipped him. They mocked him. He was shamed. And we carry so much shame, don't we? Just playing over in our minds, why did I say that? Why didn't I say that? Why did I do that? Why did I act like that again? We carry so much shame. The idea that God would endure our shame for us, take it from us, so that rather than standing uh, stained and dirty and in filthy rags before a mocking, baying crowd, we would stand in robes of Christ's pure righteousness before the heavenly armies with God saying, this is my beloved child. He took our shame and he gave us his honour and he bore our suffering. He endured suffering so that he could break it. Because Jesus is coming back. One day he will return to earth and that future will be unending light. Let me just read you one of my favourite parts of the Bible. It's from the last bit of the Bible, the book of Revelation, uh, also written by the John who wrote the bit about light earlier. And he was given a vision by Jesus of what would happen when Jesus came back. He said, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Can you imagine that? God comes to dwell with us. Jesus returns to live among us. And, and we might think what a terrifying thing. For me, in my weakness and my darkness, and my meanness to come face to face with God. And, and when we do, our, our eyes are filled with the tears of our hurt, the tears of our suffering, the tears of our guilt, the tears of our shame. And what does Jesus do? He takes his hand and he wipes the tears from our eyes. The hand which is scarred, where the nails um, hung him on the cross, wipes our tears away. 
and he lifts our downcast faces to meet his gaze and in his eyes there is nothing but love and welcome and kindness. That is our future. That is why I worship Jesus as my God, because I want to meet him. I want to see his face. It's what we live for. It's what we were made for. We we're made for that day. And that means that the present, our lives now, are the arena in which we experience Jesus' kindness. But they are the shadow lands. Um, C.S. Lewis, the, the writer, called the last chapter of his Chronicles of Narnia, Farewell to Shadow Lands. And it's his hymn to the day when Jesus comes back. Uh, it's Aslan in the story of the lion, but Aslan is Jesus. Um, but we live now in shadow lands. And I, I like that title because it reminds me not to expect too much from this world, because it is under the shadow of a deep darkness. But the light has conquered. And, and Jesus sends his light into our lives. And I wanted just to, to help you um, by just telling you what has helped me, uh, the ways Jesus has lit my path in the Shadowlands. Some of these you may know well, others you might not. The first is people. Um, I have been so blessed by family and by friends and by my church family who have loved me and pointed me to Jesus and shown me the light and given me a break and looked after me when I have been depressed. And, and goodness, Jesus very often uses our hands as his hands and our mouths to speak his words. And if you are caring for someone with depression, my hunch is that your efforts to care for them will look like they achieve nothing and yet may well be the rope that is the only thing keeping your friend from falling off the mountain. Um, they, they are used by Christ to do far more than you realise. And those of us who suffer with depression know that we are not grateful at the time. We may even be angry, but words are powerful. Embraces are powerful. Love is powerful. Prayer. We, we have a God who answers our prayers. Um, and, and I have seen that over 25 years of being a Christian. Uh, if you can, pray for yourself and pray for others. If you can't, then try to find people who will pray with you and for you. Um, because that is... That is how we cry out to a God who wants to help. Again, the Bible, God speaks to us. I have, um, if you're not a Christian, um, then, then you might find it a very odd idea to turn to the book, but the Bible is written by God himself. He used people, but he gave them the words. It's like, it's like he did dictation to a secretary. Um, and, and so the Bible is, is how God speaks into the darkness. And um, if you don't know where to start, I would read John's Gospel or ask someone to read John's Gospel to you or go on the internet and get an actor to read John's Gospel to you over the internet because it is full of Jesus and full of light. And God's words, God spoke and this creation came into being incredibly in extraordinary power God's words only his words made everything that there is Jesus spoke creation into being and and his words have the same power today in our lives find books and sermons and essays that help you what I do is because when I'm depressed I don't want to be trawling around to look for things I have a playlist on my phone of sermons that make me cry in a good way. 
um, and and I listen to them when I'm really struggling and they make me cry in a good way. And to be able to cry is quite important when you're depressed, I think. That's been my experience. Uh, creation. I think if you can summon up the energy to get outside, God made this world and depression forces us in on ourselves in the darkness and to go out into the sun and feel the wind on your face um, it, it just draws you out of yourself into a world where there is a good God. So I think if you possibly can get outside, get into the greenest place you can reach within two minutes of your house and look up um, and, and see the sky and, and the stars or the moon or the sun and, and the light set in the darkness. Uh, music. Um, music is, is a beautiful uh, blessing. There was a great Christian called Martin Luther who suffered terribly with depression and he said, um, if, you, if the darkness is on you, find music. Um, we can find music really easily. Um, he had to find an orchestra somewhere or a bloke with a guitar. Uh, we can find um, our phone. And I have found the music of uh, a singer-songwriter called Andrew Peterson um, incredibly helpful. He suffers with depression and he writes beautiful poetry about it and sings it very well. Uh, and there's an album called Dark Before the Dawn, I think. I'll put it on the next slide. Um, that I found really helpful and I've commended to others and they have too. There's a song in that where he, one of the lines is, I dreamed that I was waking at the burning edge of dawn and I could finally believe the king had loved me all along. And that line has given me in dark places an ability to, to see that even if I don't understand now why God would let these things happen, one day I will. And clinging on to that hope, when I can't cling on to the hope in the present has somehow been enough. So, um, but find music that helps you. Um, I find Bon Jovi quite helpful as well. Um, <laughs> <laughs> living on a prayer um stories uh stories can lift your heart and your soul for me the ultimate stories are the chronicles of narnia by c.s lewis anything by c.s lewis for me but uh last winter i began reading the lion the witch in the wardrobe on the first of january because i knew that the darkness would hit over the coming months there were seven books i worked my way through them i i cried my way through them and they they saved me from much darkness. Um, find what helps you. Guardians of the Galaxy was used by God to massively help me in the midst of a terrible um, season of depression. It's just a film that had such beautiful friendship in it. It reminded me what the church was for and that I needed to tell my church that I was struggling so they could help me. Um, so it doesn't have to be highbrow literature. Guardians of the Galaxy, Chris Pratt, it's not highbrow, but it is amazing. Um, find what helps and and have it close to hand write it down and pin it to your wall or, or put it on your phone or just when the darkness hits you 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 haven't got the energy to scrabble these things out they need to be in front of you tell your friends what to read you um, tell them what to play on your phone on your playlist to make it easy for them food drink hobbies Find the things that, that make you smile and receive them with thankfulness. Um, I, I often find a great cure for anxiety is stopping mid-morning and making a nice coffee in an espresso pot and saying, thank you, God, that you gave me coffee. Thank you, God, that you don't need me to work all the time and I can stop for five minutes to make a coffee. I find that is of great spiritual benefit um, and hope. God will show us things. He will, he will send the light. It's not up to us. It's up to him. Because one day there will be a farewell to Shadowlands. One day Jesus will come back and light will flood out the darkness and the darkness will never come back. That is God's promise to us. 
Um, here are some resources, that's the Andrew Nichols seminar, two organisations that you might find really helpful. They have good resources on their websites, the Biblical Counselling UK and the Christian Counselling and Education Foundation in the United States. Uh, Andrew Peterson, The Burning Edge of Dawn is the album, but anything by Andrew Peterson is worth buying. Um, some books, uh, Mark Minnell is a, a, a pastor who suffers depression, who writes very eloquently and well about it in a book called When Darkness Seems My Closest Friend. Uh, Sarah Walton and others have written a very helpful book for married couples where one of you is going through suffering, and by that I think they basically mean depression. Um, and it's called Together Through the Storms. It's very realistic if you're in a couple and that's your experience. I've not read that, but a friend I trust um, who has endured this with, with her husband and herself, they both suffered depression, uh, recommended that. Um, I've put a couple of the books that I wrote on there that, that might be of use to you um, as well. Um, that's me done. So I'll stop screen sharing uh, so we can have um, some questions and answers. Thanks so much, John. Thanks for packing a lot into a short time there. Now, we haven't got ages, but I would love people to have the opportunity to ask questions. So again, let me just remind you, please don't ask them verbally by unmuting yourself because it's really hard to see which screen is talking, but type them into the chat column. Um, I've got a couple already, so I'm going to start now. Um, thank you so much, John. Um, somebody says, one of the responses to darkness which you have shared is turning to the Bible. In the dark times, I have often struggled to do this. Coming away with guilt rather than hope. Guilt that I'm not connecting with it. Guilt that I don't know more. Guilt about the questions the text brings up rather than assuring my faith. Should I persevere with the Bible in times of darkness? Or in dark times, should I turn to something else, such as sermons? I know that our God doesn't put demands on us. Um, Jesus said, even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. Which means Jesus wants you to use what helps you find him. Um, so if the Bible is not helping and the sermon is, then that preacher is an instrument of, in God's hands. Let him take you to Jesus. If a song helps, if Guardians of the Galaxy helps, then, then thank God for grace and, um, and enjoy it, I think. Uh, I, to be honest, I turn to passages I know have been meaningful and deep in my life. I turn to Luke chapter 15, I turn to John chapter 1, I turn to Song of Songs chapter 4, um, I turn to Genesis 22, which will seem an odd one to you if you know it, but to me it's got personal reasons. I turn to Elijah in 1 Kings 19. So I don't just do my normal Bible reading because I find that too hard when I'm struggling in the darkness. I go somewhere where I... I've answered the textual questions and I've, in my case, I've preached it. Um, and, and it's a passage where I know, I know where Jesus lies in that passage and what he's doing with it, because I find it too much. Sometimes I find that too much. And um, I have David Suchet reading the NIV audio Bible on my phone and I have those passages at hand. Um, but I often turn to a sermon. I, to us, I often turn to a song or a story. Um, I've just found often those to me are gateways back. So I, I think, please, please, if you possibly can, don't feel guilty if you're struggling with your Bible reading, um, because we've, we've misunderstood. I, I think feeling guilty about struggling to read the Bible is like feeling guilty about receiving a letter from your lover. Um, it, it's just not a duty. It's, it's meant to be a blessing. And if it's not, Jesus will send you another blessing. He's, he's just better than we think he is uh, and kinder. Um, so, so the Bible is God's word. It is a, an incredible gift. But if the gift isn't helping, he'd like to give you a, another one. Thank you, John. That's great. I'm just going to combine a, a couple of questions here around the whole thing of to what extent we can expect to be cured. So um, you've talked about living now in the shadow lands. You've talked about um, hope after death. Um, people here talking about the fact that they've had been on lots of kinds of medication, counsellors, psychiatrists um, are, are using meds just to, to control 
that nothing is is curing to what extent can we expect total cure healing thank you ben. that is a very good question i you might have noticed and i may have slipped but i tend not to talk about depression as an illness because i think that leads to us thinking about cures too easily i don't mind if people talk about this. it's might be technically correct i don't know i just find the idea of curing depression is really difficult for me and for others um so i prefer to talk about it as a condition or a suffering um or a distress um so i think there's two answers i think one is i don't know i don't think it gets cured i think we live in shadow lands i think this world described in the bible as this present darkness there is a, a prince of darkness over this world um, and and so in one sense depression will be ended when the light returns when jesus comes back that is the day when depression will be ended with all darkness it will be banished in beautiful glorious shining joy and in the wiping away of tears of jesus christ but jesus is light and he brings that light into our lives. And I think we make a mistake when we think it'll just be all darkness now, and then the light returns and it all gets better. We also make a mistake if we think, well, Jesus and our lives will be all light now. The, the truth is, well, it's not that, it's wobbly. The truth is that, that we, we have Jesus as the light in our lives, those of us who are Christians. And if you are trying to, if you're trying to live with depression without that light in your life, then, then please consider Jesus Christ because I can't imagine how hard that is. I couldn't do it. Um, I, I don't think I'd be able to function if I didn't have Jesus in my life. Um, without a light as powerful as Jesus, goodness, I mean, there's enough darkness when you have a light that powerful. So, so please do, if, if you don't know Jesus, if you don't follow him, then we'd love to help so chuckle would love to help you they they would love to help you find him we would all those of us who know him love to do that he is kinder and better than you imagine if you do know him or if you come to know him i think your life will be walking with the light in the shadowlands um, and sometimes the darkness will feel overwhelming it's not but it will feel overwhelming jesus has conquered it it will not win but it will feel like it is at other times you'll bask in the light and and i think that's just how it is so i think in terms of can you expect a cure in this life i wouldn't look for a cure i'd look to walk with jesus today and and see what happens tomorrow but know that he'll be there um yeah i think so i think we should have hope because of because darkness is defeated but we should be realistic in our hope because the darkness is not yet banished for some of us that will mean our depression lifts um, for others it won't and there will be individual reasons in that but whatever they are jesus's kindness will be will be with you thank you john thank you um, i'm conscious that for many people they'll need to, to leave at this point because we have um hit the 8 30 mark but i just want to ask one more question um because it's a, a, a another very serious question um, and that's a comment on suicide um some people are asking so um it is common for people who are suffering with depression to struggle with suicidal thoughts to want to go to sleep and not to wake up the next day and have that feeling of um, dread and despair as consciousness hits. Um, sorry to ask you to be brief, John, on such a big subject, but is there anything you would say to those who are struggling with suicidal thoughts at the moment? I think, um, yeah, a couple of things. Um, partly that there is a, a misconception that we have when we're depressed that there is no hope. And part of that is that we misunderstand how loved we are and how cared for. And if that is you, please talk to somebody about it tonight. Um, please talk to, to someone here or pick up the phone to a friend because you have misunderstood how much you will be missed and how much you are loved and how much you are needed. And we do misunderstand that when we're depressed. 
um, because because the what you actually desire the 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 bit of that desire that makes it so strong is that there is a right desire for the pain to end and to be with Jesus. But you have wrongly connected that with a desire to, to end your own life. And that's why it's so powerful, because there is something, of course, we long for Jesus to come back. Of course, we long to be face to face with Jesus, which for those of us who trust him will happen when we die. Um, but to long for that through taking our own lives, through the pain and hurt that will cause to people who do love you, through the, the misery and, and an awful end that that is, that is, we've made a wrong connection. Um, and depression allows us to make that wrong connection without spotting what we're doing. So um, by saying this, I'm hoping for some of you to uncouple those two that go to bed and rather than, than feeling or contemplating how you might end it, maybe say, no, I, I want to pray, come Lord Jesus. And then shifting that to the right desire, um, away from that, that wrong and dark desire. Um, but if that is you, it, it is important to talk to somebody because you don't know me, but trust me that you have made a misunderstanding. Um, of of your life and your value and how you are loved um, and and that would be something worth talking through with a counselor um, with a doctor getting help with because if you've got to that point that there, there is help available from those who know what they're talking about uh, with with more expertise than I do thank you John for answering a very difficult question um, so helpfully so i want to thank you so much we're going to have to finish there because our time is up but john you have been very helpful thank you for speaking so clearly from the bible but so sensitively about such a, a tough issue we really appreciate that and we appreciate your own honesty um, other people have have mentioned that and asked uh, that i can thank you for that thank you for your honesty and uh, sharing your own personal struggles in this. It's been very valuable, so thank you. And um, just to follow up on what John has, has said, um, yes, please do get in touch. You can find us at www.surreychapel.org.uk and we would love to hear from you if you would like to ask any more questions related to this issue, or if you have been intrigued by what you've heard that there is, a God who can bring light and hope in the midst of the darkness that you are experiencing now. We'd love to talk to you. Um, we'd love to send you a free Bible. We can help you find ways to investigate Christianity more. So please do get in touch. Uh, we've also said in each of these webinars that um, there is no better time than to find out what church um, a church service is like than at the moment because you can do that at the, the click of a button at the moment online again sorry chapel we release a, a, a recording of a service at nine o'clock every sunday morning so again you can find those things on our youtube channel or, or on the website but come and see what goes on come and hear more teaching from the bible come and hear more about this god who knows you in your suffering so thank you for joining us tonight i want to thank kieran who has done all the background hard work he's our techie and sadly he lost his wi-fi connection can you believe it about halfway through this evening so we've lost him <laughs> but i wanted to say thank you to him for all his help thank you for john who said we really appreciate your input tonight and to everyone that leaves me to say have a good night <laughs>